Well, good. Um, I'm Tom Ball from Microsoft Research. I've been here uh, in Microsoft Research 19 years, and you're on Building 99, which is the central mothership of Microsoft Research, and we're really happy uh, to be able to have you here uh, today. Um, Michal Moskal is here as well from the Make Code team, and he will be uh, available, hopefully, as I can't answer questions, because he's the brains behind a lot of the system. Uh, two years ago, I was talking to you about the BBC Microbit. So the BBC, in the 80s, did something called the Micro. It was a Apple II-like computer in the 80s that a lot of uh, um, kids back then in the UK learned how to code on. And the BBC got together with then Acorn Computing, which then became ARM, I guess, made that. They wanted to do uh, a 21st century version of the micro, and they call it the microbit. So it's an embedded processor with an accelerometer and Bluetooth and sensors, and they wanted fifth graders to program it. So, hmm, how are you gonna do that? And so uh, two, three years ago, we got involved uh, with the programming environment to make the microbit easy to program. And um, today, what I'm gonna show you is we've expanded beyond what we did uh, from the microbit to other uh, Cortex class devices with other types of sensors to um, component based um, um, circuits where you take the boards and clip them together and make your own circuit uh, to um, you know things like uh, Arduino style where you wire up to servos to $200 robot um, and as well as sort of classic Arduino maker style boards. So we've We've expanded beyond the BBC microbit with a with a, a platform, and that platform is called uh, Microsoft Make Code. And the mystery title is how we bridge the gap between uh, C++ and C and C++, which is the lingua franca for these boards, and sort of um, the web side, which is where we come from. So how do we bring the world of the web and JavaScript and TypeScript and all this together with the world of microcontrollers? So this 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 microbit has been programmed already. If you press the A button. It makes an X if you uh, press the B button, makes a smiley if you shake it, it clears. So you can just see uh, how that works. And this, this will last for probably weeks on battery power, so it's quite efficient. Okay, so um, let's just dive into it then. Uh, Microsoft Make Code is now a Microsoft supported product. It's a, it's a website you go to, and uh, the idea is wherever you are, you can program embedded devices, whether you're on a Chromebook or on a Windows or a Mac OS or even on an iPhone. And the idea is uh, um, not just to program games in a web browser, but to use the web browser and then create a project that uses an embedded a microcontroller that you're going to put into a robot or uh, a creation of yours to be created. So the idea of make code is that you're going to be making in the sense of taking a computer and putting it into a project, and you're also going to be programming it. And people sometimes call that physical computing when they're talking about embedded computing for education. Um, we want to have a very simple on-ramp to coding, but also get to a real programming language, in our case, JavaScript. Uh, and we want a nice platform, so we want to support a diversity of devices, not just the microbit. Uh, so those are, those are sort of the, uh, the goals. Um, some other objectives, why is Microsoft doing this? Well, we funded a lot of uh, efforts in computing. In computing, as you just heard, we need more computer scientists because there are all these jobs. Where are they going to come from? We need to get more people interested in learning about computers and learning about programming and learning about the concepts. So we want to increase the diversity and number of students who are interested. And one way to do that is to bring exciting sort of projects, uh, project-based learning uh, to the classroom. Um, we used to, you know, have this thing called Visual Basic 6, and a lot of people learned how to code, but times have moved, so, you know, we, we, are, we are trying to regain a seat at the, uh, uh, at the education table through efforts like uh, Make Code. We also have something called Teals, which is about pairing up uh, technologists with uh, APCS teachers in the classroom. So uh, we have a number of uh, initiatives there. And then the ecosystem, we, we really believe that uh, we should, just like in the days of the, the PC and BASIC, we should make it easy to take what people consider to be complex systems and make them simple to get started with. Even though there's a huge law, a huge maybe long tail of complexity of things to learn, um, why, should these be, why should these devices be hard uh, to start learning with? So really, uh, sort of the original sort of Microsoft goal of sort of 
um, a PC on every desktop, but also you know the programming language built in, and you can start programming it. Um, and really having a set of partners who, who create the hardware that we uh, that we uh, provide the software for. So if you go to makecode.com, uh, you will see a website, and uh, that's a snapshot of it. So I'll just click on that. And there's good verification, please. Thank you. Okay, and, uh, and if you go to makecode.com, you will see essentially a bunch of cards, and these cards represent the different devices, and if you click on the cards, you'll go to the editor. We have one that's not a device, it's called Minecraft. You might <coughs> recall Microsoft invested a little bit in that. Um, and and, and makecode supports um, uh, a built-in simulator, I'll show you that, so you can test your program before putting it on the board, it, it supports Blockly style drag and drop programming and it, it supports JavaScript, so two editors with round tripping. Uh, it's all about making and coding, right? So here's an air guitar where you're using the accelerometer uh, to change the pitch. Uh, here's a little robot where you're using a servo uh, to control the mouth. The micro bit here in front is responding. It's got a light sensor, so the light flash is causing the mouth to move. Um, here's a magic wand. So a lot of these projects uh, are really about creating something, uh, personalizing it, um, whether it's the robot or the wallet, and then adding com computing into it and computation to make it to make it alive. So we have a ton of projects, and teachers also uh, want to teach. So we have courses as well. So we have introductory computer science course, 14-week course with the microbit, another one with Minecraft, and and other courses. So we. We hope that every project we have uh, will have a, have a course. Um, and so we're working on that for each of these devices. So what I'm going to do today is just show you quickly how we program uh, this, this little gadget. It's the Adafruit Circuit Playground Express. And I'll put that on the camera. Uh, and if, if anybody, I see, sir, you have a, you have a, a Mac MacBook. Would you like to try? Follow along? Sure. So just to prove that it can be done on, on something other than Windows. Uh, you can just follow along with me, and it should just work. What, what you're seeing here is a web app, and we click on we click on that, and he's not a plant, by the way. Uh, and we see it, we see a, we see our home page, and notice it's makecode.adafruit.com. Adafruit.com is our partner. They're the ones who make this beautiful box and who make the uh, the circuit playground. Here, I'll I'll pass this one around. I think this one is just this one. This uses this has the NeoPixel, so it has beautiful. RGB colors. So you go to this web app, and uh, what you see here is uh, a list of tutorials and, and costumes and games and projects. Each of these is a is a it's a project you can make and code with. Uh, here I'm just going to start with new project. Just click on new project, uh, and uh, we will we will see the editor immediately. So the editor has essentially uh, uh, two basic parts. It has a simulator where we uh, simulate as much of the functionality of the device as we can. So you test before you put the code on. Uh, and then we have a, program, a set of programming categories and a canvas. Uh, have, have, how many here have seen Scratch or Blockly, the visual style programming? OK. So what we're going to do here is just make a simple program using drag and drop. Uh, so we have, we have events. So we might want to do something when uh, this device, when we shake it. Right, and so we're going to get a shake event, uh, and on shake, uh, what are we going to do? Um, we're going to do this show ring, and the show ring looks a lot like the uh, looks a lot like the device. We can select some colors here, and we can make some of them green. Okay, so whenever we shake it, uh, we're going to make this pattern. Maybe we, we make some other colors: yellow, yellow, blue, blue. Okay, so so here programming at a very high level, right? We just have a graphic representation of the device. We have a, a handler, um, and, and, and so maybe we want to also be able to uh, do something on a loud sound, because it's got a little microphone. So when we make a loud sound, um, we will, uh, I don't remember where clear is, so I'm going to search. We're going to clear all the all pixels. Okay, so now we have uh, a program, and over here we can shake with the mouse, and you see the pattern. And then, uh, uh, no, we can't do the loud sound, but we can simulate the loud sound here Okay, with that little device. So we simulate as much of the sensors as we can possibly. Uh, maybe we also want to do something else on the A button. So on the A button, which is the left button over here, let's make the NeoPixels do something nice. So for the A button, we'll just make them uh, 
Sure. There we go. Okay. So now uh, we've got this device. Um, how do we program it? We've got our program. If, if, you, um, if you plug this device into pretty much any computer that supports USB pen drives, then you will see here uh, that... Um, at the, well, let me, let me actually make this one a bit smaller. And on the Mac, it will look different, of course. Apologies for that. But, um, yeah, if we go here and uh, try to... There we go. Uh, if we go down, we will see... Oh, there's a C-play boot. So that's a drop. So this little microcontroller presents itself as essentially um, a write-only drive where you can drag, well, read-only, that accepts only one type of file, the, the UF2 format that is sort of like a hex file, but more efficient. So what we're going to do is click on the browser download, and we're going to get the file that is the result of compiling all the way from the blocks to TypeScript to assembly language to machine code, linking it against a pre-compiled C++ runtime in the browser. No C++ compiler was uh, invoked in this uh, effort. And we get, uh, we get this binary, uh, this UF2 file, and we drag and drop it onto C play boot. And now it's programmed. So if I switch to the camera here, there we go. OK, so there's my, there's my device. Oh, I just shook it, so it's got that pattern on it. I don't know. I can see it very well. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, what did I do? Snap. I'm not snapping. I don't know. sound, please. There we go. It's off. Shake it. It's back on. Let's snap. And the A button is back on. Oh. So basically, you saw in under five minutes, right, I was able to code in the web browser. Um, I was able to simulate it. I hit the download button. We didn't go out to any web server. We just compiled in into a binary file. The firmware on here, thanks to Mihao, accepts the file and flashes it directly into flash memory. Here's a nice format. He can tell you more about that later. Uh, and we, we can do more. So we want to go between blocks and JavaScript. Click on JavaScript. Now you see the code in Monaco, which is the editor for Visual VS Code. So this is a fully functional uh, JavaScript editor uh, with IntelliSense. So if I do input dot, I see all the things now that I can do, not just the ones available from blocks. Um, my categories are still here, so if I forget how to do something, I can uh, I can say, oh, button, button is pressed. I can drag and drop the code. So I've got code snippets. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, to, uh, to make it uh, a progressive editor. You can start with the blocks to make it easy. Uh, but here you can come in and you can write a class, foo, right? And you can start doing object-oriented programming. When you go back to blocks, we preserve all the code, but some of that code will, might be uneditable because we don't have a blockly representation. So, for example, in the case of the class foo, the code is preserved, it's executable, um, but, uh, but, uh, and runnable, but it's not editable in blocks. So were you, uh, were you able to meet with success and get a piece of code running? Not quite. Okay. <laughs> what did you run into? Uh, web connectivity. Wi-Fi. Oh, bummer! You have to be on Guest Network. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Send me an email. We'll get you on afterwards. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I should have. This is See, you weren't the plant. One of the main reasons why we do the everything in the browser. So once you load it once, mm -hmm. you will have to have Wi-Fi. Right. Because this is a very common problem in schools. Right. Right. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so this is, this is, these are the essentials. I'll go into a little bit more detail in the talk about how we make this all happen. We have a sharing facility, so if you want to publish your project and share it with others, you can get an anonymous URL. We store that in the cloud for you. And there's a lot more to say, but these are the essentials. We have two ways of coding. We have actually a simulator and the ability to compile in the browser. And we, we, we have a layered set of APIs. So you saw that we have these very high level uh, blocks like on shake and show ring, but if you want, you can go down to the pin level, just like an Arduino, right? And you can do digital write, analog read. You can you can pull, you can do PWM, right? So all the things you might be familiar with from Arduino style programming are there in the advanced section. Uh, and even with the uh, even with things like the um, with the ring of lights, you know, you can you can program at a high level. You can select animations you can program your own animations directly. So we've done a lot of um, in investing in the, uh, in, the in the device APIs. Right, so 
Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, how is the microphone read? It, are you just reading a voltage level from it? Can you get it at that level, or uh, is, it, is there some processing before you get to it? I, on this one, I think the microphone has a, uh, there is an external uh, analog digital converter, converter, and the CPU is connected to it by I2S. So you can read the uh, voltage level on the Mm, so you don't get to read the yeah. voltage level, you get the you get the digital kind of stream of data. So you do get a digital stream of yes, data? On this, okay. one, yeah. on this particular microphone. So, But for example, the light sensor, you can go and read the voltage level. But we have then have like a higher level thing where you, I guess for light we don't read, but for temperature, you, we give you the degrees, right? Or you could go and read the, the digital level. Because I was wondering if you could do things like uh, Encode to an FFT on your microphone. Is that possible? <laughs> oh, sure. In principle, yes. Okay, so there's enough low level access that you can do that. Yeah, I mean, you can always go down to C and write your package in C. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll show you how. It's, it's a very layered system. So, this talk is really about bridging these two worlds <laughs> the world of the web, where you have plentiful RAM on the desktop or laptop, a web app. JavaScript was his single-threaded JavaScript, or as we prefer, TypeScript, which we talked about before. And then on the bottom, we have the world of the microcontroller. Uh, the, the micro bit has 16K of RAM. Um, you, you're programming a full bare metal binary. You don't have an operating system under you or a web browser. It's, it's reactive and concurrent, and generally C and C++ are the two worlds. So um, that's really the subject of this talk. It's about two languages in some sense. It's about how we bridge the gap between TypeScript and C++ to bring the world of the web browser and the world of the microcontroller unit together. And we do that through, surprise, surprise, languages, compilers, runtime, all the, all the, the stuff that, uh, that you know and, and love and, and work with, with every day. So, so these are our main innovations. Uh, at the top, we have a web app for the end-to-end -end experience. You don't need to install uh, a tool chain for the end user. There's an in-browser compiler all the way from the blocks down to TypeScript to essentially uh, Cortex-M0 uh, for now. Um, but other, other processors are available as well. Um, and, and linking against the pre-compiled C++ runtime all in the browser. TypeScript, as you'll see, is our sort of core language. It's the glue between C++ and the Blockly, the visual programming. And in fact, uh, we'll see in the talk how we go from C++ to TypeScript, how we sort of uh, take C++ and uh, annotate it in the comments to expose it to TypeScript into the world of the web, and then on the way back down, how we compile back uh, so that we're consistent with the C++ from which we derive the whole environment. Um, TypeScript is great because if you slim it down, it actually looks like uh, 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 a modern Java or C sharp. It's got classes and objects and things that make it easier to um, uh, uh, interoperate with C++, sufficiently restricted. Um, and then at the bottom we have a little operating system that was not done by us, by was done by our colleagues on the microbit from Lancaster University. Uh, and they created uh, a little runtime that has events and a message bus and coroutines, essentially uh, non-preemptive fibers, so we can do concurrent uh, tricks down at the runtime, uh, and uh, well, that's where a lot of the C++ is. So how many are familiar with TypeScript? Yeah, so you all know JavaScript, I assume. Uh, TypeScript is, is Microsoft's uh, way to add typing to JavaScript gradually. It means you can take any JavaScript program, and it's a TypeScript program, but you can start to sprinkle types in, and the reason for putting types in is essentially to get the better productivity for large-scale projects. If you have namespaces and types and classes and all these things, uh, enable productivity. So it's not about really, um, like in C++, uh, getting efficient code out. Uh, I mean, we are using it to do that, but, uh, but, but it's really led the way. In fact, JavaScript, the ECMA 6 uh, script, 6, has taken a lot of ideas from TypeScript and putting, or putting them into JavaScript. So in some sense, you can think of this as a JavaScript with, with these types you can add and much better type checking and type inference. Uh, and that's an effort uh, that is uh, led by Anders Heilsberg, who created 
many, many languages, including C-sharp. So he's the, he's the lead on that. And that's sort of the core of our, uh, that's the core of what we uh, use. So when you saw in the, in the web app, you saw these categories uh, for the blocks, um, and then the different blocks. Each one of those categories really corresponds to a namespace in TypeScript. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence when you're editing between what's happening on the block side and what you can do on the TypeScript side. In general, TypeScript uh, for the device runtime, we offer more functions and we offer fewer, we offer a subset of those functions. So as you go from block to TypeScript, you have the same uh, set of uh, categories. Categories in Blockly translate into namespaces. Those namespaces are manifest in the text. Um, how does that all come about? So in the micro bit, um, we wrote this C++ uh, to show a number on the micro bit screen. Okay. And there's show number at the bottom, uh, which had, takes a value to show, and uh, um, a timing interval, an optional parameter. And then we have these special comments, and these comments say, this C++ should be exposed to make code. We want this to be visible in the runtime binary. There's going to be a lot of C++ that's not going to be. We can expose more and more. But we put these annotations in, and it's also in a, a namespace. And that namespace is annotated. So this means that in the micro bit, we're going to have a namespace, and we're going to have this function available. And it's going to be available as a block. Um, and so we're saying export the C++ function all the way to the top, all the way to Blockly. And along the way, we'll also get TypeScript. Um, so we will also, so right, so you will see show number as a block, and that block will be compiled. We will compile that block definition automatically from the annotation. So you don't have to know, as a C++ programmer, what Blockly is or how Blockly works. You have to know our little annotation language, um, which tells uh, what text should you show for you know, the block, um, which might be different, it might have a space in it, uh, and which parameters do you want to expose? So you, you see in show number, there's only a single parameter, so we, we hide the optional parameter uh, when we show the blocks. And then also, on the TypeScript side, we're going to get, you know, a function as well, and that's going to be available to uh, the, the editor and have IntelliSense and all these things. So just from doing this little bit of extra work, We've, we've, uh, we've surfaced the C++ into make code. Uh, so here's another example from the micro bit. In this case, uh, our, our, our colleagues in Lancaster, they really like components. So they have a component called ubit. It represents the whole micro bit. It has a display inside it. The display has a current image to show, and then you can set the pixel value on that. And so this long string here, C++, is telling us to set the value at xy. But when we want to show that in TypeScript, uh, we just want a plot function in the LED namespace. So here is often what we're doing. We're wrapping the underlying C++, which has a lot of complexity, um, and we're, we're simplifying it. And again, we do these annotations. So once, we, once we've uh, exposed this function, uh, we can actually write TypeScript against it. Right? So this could be a, a user a piece of user code calling led.plot. And our compiler is going to take that and recognize, oh yeah, we've got a C++ shim, uh, C++ function that corresponds to this TypeScript. And uh, we're going to do all the marshalling and everything we need to do to call it. But this is actually something that we wrote. Uh, end user didn't write it. We wrote it because the micro bit didn't have a way to turn on all the LEDs. So we just wrote this function, but we didn't write it in C++. We wrote it in TypeScript. And then our compiler will compile this and also put it on the device, you know, call it, linking it against the C++. But you also saw that we have the simulator. So what about the simulator? So the simulator has to also do a plot function, and that's written essentially in JavaScript. And here we're, we're essentially calling uh, functions that are going to go against the DOM in the browser. So, so every function in the device runtime uh, can have, uh, well, there are, two, there are two really, there are two ways to think of it. There's the device runtime, which is really what gets put on the bare metal. That's here. Um, that device runtime can be augmented with TypeScript, so it doesn't all have to be in C++. And then uh, for every function in the device runtime, we can choose to, if we want it in the simulator, write some JavaScript to implement uh, the function uh, to go against the DOM. Okay, so we try as much as possible uh, to uh, um, 
uh, have a very small C++ layer that has sort of low level, uh, uh, low level operations. And well, actually, that was our way we did it originally, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's an interesting dividing line. How much should you code in C++? How much should you code in TypeScript? Um, and if you put a lot in the runtime, uh, in the C++ runtime, then you might have to duplicate your code to to simulate that in the JavaScript. And so we played with different uh, different ways of going after that. So this is this is sort of what's happening uh, at, more at the architectural level or the flow level in the web app. If we just think of it without a device, if we just think of it as a pure web app that you might just program in. So there's there's Blockly and Monaco. Those are the two editors. And from Blockly, we compile to TypeScript, and we can go back. So we have the round trip. That's here. Um, TypeScript down here, this represents the runtime. So every any time you want to expose a device runtime to make code, it ha it's done in TypeScript. OK. Uh, now there's a, uh, and that TypeScript essentially parameterizes Blockly. It tells us which blocks are there, and, and also uh, the editor. We have a compiler that gives us an IR, and we can do the simulator. So that, if we didn't have a device, that would be all we had. But you know, what I've shown you is that our notion of a device runtime includes C++, and we have a way to annotate the C++ to get essentially a, a, a TypeScript version of the C++ interface. Right? And from there, uh, we can compile back to C++. Uh, we can also uh, link against the runtime. So somebody's going to compile that C++ for us. We have a cloud service that does that. And generally, this is done once in a, a very long time because we don't change the C++ a lot. This runtime binary is then cached in the web app. And then inside, what you saw when I pressed the download button was we compile the user code in TypeScript and the runtime in TypeScript into an IR. <coughs> we lower it to assembly. We get a user binary. And we essentially patch and link it against the runtime binary. And then when we get, as a result, we get the final binary. So the only time a C++ compiler is being invoked is somewhere in the cloud, once in a blue moon, when we need to update the C++ runtime. Then the HTML app update mechanism will take care of when we have a new runtime of just copying it into the web app, refreshing the window. So that's sort of what you saw when when I was programming and when I was compiling, doing the simulator and pressing download. You, this did not take place. This took place, I don't know, a week ago or whenever we last compiled the runtime. Any, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, you say IR. Is that the LLVM IR? Mm. No, it's our own specially designed IR. We are, yeah, it's our own little IR. It's written in, it, this is all written in TypeScript, so all this is JavaScript up here. Oh, I see. It's, it's, our, it's our own data structure. We need to do some transformations on our program, both for the simulator and for uh, the downstream assembler. Uh -huh. So we have our own compiler chain, uh, no LLVM. So you go from JavaScript to assembly? We go from JavaScript to assembly to machine code in the browser. And we link in the browser against the pre-compiled. So you go to an assembler in JavaScript? Yeah, of course. I yeah. see. Sure. Sure. We could have put LLVM into it, but it would have it would have create, created a larger web app. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so the first thing I want to do in the remaining time is go bottom up. So I want to tell you about our C++ code, and most of the C++ code is is done by Lancaster University, and that's this runtime. Uh, and then I want to show you sort of after that I'm going to show you what we call common packages. So many of these devices. You know, this has an accelerometer, this has an accelerometer, this has an accelerometer. We don't want to, we want to have the same programming approach to all accelerometers. Now, some accelerometer might have a cool feature. Yeah, we can add a new block for that. So common packages is our way of abstracting over all the different devices we might have here and giving them a common look and feel in the blocks, in the programming blocks, in the API layering. Everything we do for one device, when you go to another device, you'll be, oh yeah, I remember. I did accelerometer there with OnShake. I, I, do I have an accelerometer here? Yes, oh, I have an OnShake event. You know, it works the same way. And um, so this is our glue. And then at the top, we have something called a target. Uh, a target is the actual code that defines the entire web app for a particular device. So um, this is a low level going to the high level. And all this, by the way, is open source under MIT. Uh, the new Microsoft, we, we, we like open source a lot. And in fact, this 
this is this is open source from day zero, so we've been in out in the open. So this is this is just a little diagram of what they did at Lancaster University. Um, we split things into repos. It sort of looks like inheritance, but it's done by uh, inheriting code from uh, GitHub repos. We have a base a base uh, repo called Codal Core, which defines a set of abstractions, and then we have uh, other repos that specialize it for different processor types. And then we have essentially uh, particular boards. And it's actually more complex than that, but uh, all, all, uh, all blame and uh, kudos go to Lancaster University for this structure. Uh, if you want to see more about it, the, uh, the whole build environment and build tools are here. Um, and uh, all these slides will be available. So I just want to show you one of the, I just want to show you the accelerometer, just to give you an idea of Codal. We're not going to do much of the tour here. Um, so uh, Codal has, uh, um, it has, um, because we want to support JavaScript, it has some things like manage buffer and manage string and manage types. It has a reference count, uh, re reference counting for those. Uh, it has a, a base set of core abstractions that involve a heap allocator, an event model. Uh, so actually, the abstraction level is pretty high compared to Embed or Arduino. So there's actually a message bus. You, you can subscribe. Every device, and, uh, whether it's physical or virtual, uh, can listen on a message bus. Uh, it, it's quite nice for uh, compiling into. So there's a Codal component. Uh, in every uh, every um, Every component of, the, of a, every part of a device should be a Codal component, um, and and so there's there's a whole lot of work going on here that I am not going to go into. But if we go to um, driver models, we will see, for example, accelerometer.h, right? And here uh, we will see um, essentially uh, class accelerometer, which is a public co Codal component, and then uh, uh, essentially. All, all the ways uh, we need to collect data around this uh, accelerometer to do just some basic gesture recognition. So, so this, is, this is far from a very low level abstraction. It, it in, encapsulates a bunch of behavior uh, to allow us to do very simple gestures um, uh, and it's parameterized so uh, maybe your coordinate system might change between different devices. Uh, there's been a lot of thought uh, that's gone into Codal. Um, and essentially, I think that's all I'm going to say about this, because we don't have the experts here. Just to say that uh, this has been really a three-year path for Codal. It started with the microbit, which was just for a single device, and Codal is now the component-oriented device abstraction layer that we use essentially for all, most of these devices here. Some, some of our hardware partners like to do their own runtimes, that's fine. Um, but if you do Codal, uh, you get uh, you get a set of base, ab base abstractions that really help. You get the non-preemptive scheduler with fibers, so you get coroutines. You get a message bus with events. Uh, and, and that actually fits very well uh, with JavaScript in some sense. We, we, JavaScript's a very event-based language. And so uh, Codal was really designed to help support scripting languages. Okay. So the next thing that happens is these common packages. So anybody, you could just program these devices using Codal in C++. So if you're a student who's like had enough of our web app and you're like, show me how it's really done, we have nice abstractions that, that actually we have this mapping and you could go down and use Visual Studio. Um, but we need to abstract over, over Codal and we do this in what, what I was calling common packages. So common packages essentially references all the base classes for the most part and then it, it adds wrappers and all the annotations uh, to make it visible to what we call PXT. PXT is the uh, old name of make code. So PXT, each one of these things is a repo. PXT common packages is a repo. PXT is our framework. It's the thing that defines all the plumbing and the has the compiler, has all the editors and, and everything. And it uses Blockly and TypeScript and Monaco, which are all open source uh, editors we just suck in. Uh, I mean, TypeScript is the language service. Monaco is the editor you saw. Blockly is the, the blocks. Okay. So let's just take a very quick look uh, at, uh, at essentially um, this file, which is, from, uh, which is from our common packages. And so um, here you will see, oh, we're referencing Codal. Um, 
and we're getting out, uh, well, in this case, a particular, uh, uh, a particular, uh, you can override so, it. but you can See, override this. It's in a, it's in a, oh, thank you, it's in a, yes, thank you, very good. If it's not defined. Yes, right. if a board has a different one, then you would. Right, so common packages has sort of a default accelerometer, but you can always override it. Now, here's where things start to get interesting, right? So, um, we'll go back and take a look at this. We're going to define a bunch of enumerations, right? And these are all going to be made visible to make code through, um, through these annotations. Because often when you're in Blockly, you're not going to be typing, you're going to be selecting. And so we need to be able to select X, Y, or Z if we're reading the accelerometer value at a, at a, in a particular uh, uh, coordinate. Uh, we want to also uh, talk about the accelerate, accelerator range, um, uh, and we want to talk about gestures. So each of these you see is an enum, which uh, enum class, which is in C++, and then annotated to make it visible uh, to, to make code. And if we keep going, you'll see there's a lot there. We'll get down here, and finally we see namespace input. Ah, so in the input namespace, we are going to have something called on gesture. And that gesture takes one of the enums, and it takes something called an action, which is essentially a lambda, parameterless lambda. And this function uh, is going to be exposed to make code using, using these annotations. So going back uh, to my picture, I could also show this to you. Okay, so all that code we just looked at, over here, what does it translate into? So that, that on gesture is going to be on percent name. There's a whole issue of how that gets populated, but that's a parameter because we can have, we can have, different, um, we can have different handlers for different types of gestures. Uh, so we're going to get on shake and actually see it's a pull down. So that's a parameter, which is not a runtime parameter pile time, right? Uh, and then when we click there, we're going to get a box to select from, uh, and we have to select one of these 11. And where do these names come from? They come from the anew. So all this happens for you behind the scene. With that little annotation, we are going to generate the block for you. We're also going to generate this field editor. Well, actually, you had to tell, tell us that you wanted a field editor. but all this means is that this, this block, it's really easy to code with touch. So this whole Blockly interface uh, is tuned for touch. So you're getting a lot. Uh, and uh, this is all part of common packages. So when you're, when, you're coding, when you're using an accelerometer from a make code device that's based on common packages, uh, you're going to have that same experience with with object. Now, maybe some of these, like 3G, 6G, maybe your particular accelerometer might not have certain options. Right. So, questions about that? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so that's sort of common packages gluing or representing the C++ to make code. Then finally, we have to, we actually have to get a target. So, like the editor I showed you for the particular device, because up to this point, I've just shown you sort of bottom up. So finally, we're going to get you know, a PX target. It's going to actually reference the code I'll build shell and say, I need you to build me the binary for all this C++. And uh, this PX target is going to make use of common packages as well, which includes some C++. Um, all that C++ is going to get munched together in a, in a build system, which I can't even begin to describe to you how it works. It's, let's say, non-standard is the best way to talk about how that works right now. But we're going to get a bunch of C++ and compile, uh, compile and get a binary. I'll, sh I'll tell you about that. And in the end, we're going to get a web app uh, that we can then host in a, in, in a number of ways. Uh, so for example, oh yeah, so, okay, so, so let me talk about a little bit about this process of how we're compiling all that C++. There's a pre-processing of the C++, which is determining which C++ entities are going to be visible and exported via what's called a TypeScript declaration file. I'll show you that. So that's the processing of all these annotations, these funny comments I showed you. Right. Um, so we do some pre-processing. And then, of course, we need to have a mapping. I mean, we need to, if we're going to generate TypeScript code that corresponds to the C++ we've exported, 
then we have to have a, some correspondence. So we have a we have a, a correspondence between the primitives, booleans, numbers, strings, enums, lambdas, functions, namespaces, a set of fixed runtime collections, and a little hack here or there for exposing the methods of a C++ class. So the, the sad part of this is we're not actually um, exposing all of the glorious object-oriented or object orientation of C++. Like, you don't get a TypeScript class for every C++ class. It, essentially, you get to choose a bunch of functions and data types you want to expose. Um, more work could be done to enrich this mapping, but so far, this has been pretty good. One of the reasons for that is at the Blockly level, Blockly is pretty much like C. It's very C-oriented. We don't have like a nice way to do object orientation in the blocks. In TypeScript, we do. So eventually, we could make the TypeScript and the C++ have more of a one-to-one -one correspondence. But right now, we, we really functionalize it. Uh, and then also, we finally invoke a C++ compiler. Right after we've scraped the C++ and found the mappings, yes, we are going to compile the whole thing, and we're going to keep track of what the exported points are. We're going to get a binary blob, which we will link against later. Okay. So, um, yeah, so let me just show you, for, for, first of all, what, what uh, exporting C++ to TypeScript looks like. So when we actually build the Adafruit, it turns out we need to override some of, of the, uh, the defines for the accelerometer because the way the accelerometer is positioned here and here is different. So X, Y, and Z, you know, to make them match up, you have to switch things around. So, so this is basically, you know, overriding, uh, it's a file that's overriding uh, one of the files in uh, common packages. So there's a default, and then we can, well, not really overriding it. We're, we're just defining for uh, the circuit playground which way is up. Okay. Now, once all this is done and the C++ is processed, we get this file, and at the top it has the famous comment, auto-generated, do not edit. This is TypeScript, and this is the onGesture function, which we saw before in C++, but we're no longer in C++. This is what's called a TypeScript declaration file. So no executable code, but everything you need to do, IntelliSense, everything we need to say, oh, this is a TypeScript function that corresponds to this C++ uh, the C++, so we've remembered where it came from. And remember all those annotations on the C++, they just got lifted up to TypeScript. So everything make code does actually, in the end, is not aware of C++, except for the compiler in the end, but even very little of that knows about C++. Um, everything is generated, the blocks and all the, all the uh, IntelliSense is driven by this TypeScript declaration file, which is sort of like a .h file. It's TypeScript's way of just of saying, for this big chunk of JavaScript, here are the types I care about. In this case, we're using that same uh, same function. So if you functionality. So if you go to this uh, to this uh, shim file, uh, yeah, you'll see you'll see gesture, you'll see rotation, uh, you'll see all the functions in in uh, in the accelerometer names in the input namespace around the accelerometer. There we go. Okay, so, so that's sort of it going up. Everything I've shown you here, the, the basic framework, Blockly, Monica TypeScript, common packages. We have a bunch of targets. So the microbit was our original one, the Adafruit. All the source code for this is, is, is open source. So most of our targets and our partners, we ask them to go open source because we're generally open. Okay, so any questions about that, sort of the how we sort of go from C++ and raise it up. Uh, yeah? Do you have a parser that parses the definition files for the Blockly stuff? So to generate all... Okay, so the way it goes is we, we have a preprocessor that goes over C++, and the C++ has to be very carefully written because it's, it's a not a parser. Regex. It's like a regex. Excellent. And we go over the C++ and we find the comments, and we, we parse as much as possible just the, the function declaration, right? We generate, we generate this file, mm -hmm. okay? TypeScript can take this file and read it in. Right. Okay, now we, we then uh, take the TypeScript AST, we look for these comments, and then from this, we have a Blockly compiler, which generates all the XML and all the things Blockly needs to know to make the blocks, right? So, so fundamentally, um, 
you do not, unless you really know Blockly and want to do something that we are not supporting, you don't have to do Blockly. Gotcha. But the Blockly code is there, and if you need to go in and do some mutation and all the garbage they support for hooking dynamically, you're free to do that. But for sort of the common case, we hope if you use common packages, and, and or if you want to define your own block, we have a set essentially of, of little attributes that should cover 80% of what most people want to do. And also, most of those things are optional. So, like for example, the first one it tells you whether the help is for that particular one, right? So, I have no help. And the second one is, uh, uh, I think the only thing that you have to say is block, and then yeah. you come up with some block ID and you kind of come up with some sort of block shape that you may or may not be happy with. Happy with. Yeah, so this is actually, you know, these are actually a lot of annotations because we are providing, because we've done a lot of work to make that block really nice. Right. But um, to get started, you only actually need slash slash percent block. Okay. You just need one line. So, yeah. Are the regexes that you mentioned readily accessible in case the TypeScript that's generated doesn't match what we would, what we would expect? Uh, the regexes, oh, yeah. You, you, the, you, okay, we have a scanner for the C++. When I was talking about the regular expressions, yeah, it's readily available inside the PXT repo. <laughs> I mean, okay. it's not configured. Okay. You, if, if, you, if you were like, ugh, oh, you know, you're not handling this C++ idiom correctly, mm, you can always send us a pull request. <laughs> yeah, that, that part, there's a lot of the compiler that's yeah, baked in and, and not highly configured. I noticed that you're using Doxygen like uh, commentary in the oh. at several different levels. Are, is, yes. is is that documentation le level part of part of the system? Yes. Or is this sort of no, very on good. for Doxygen? No, 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 very good. No, no, we are using this in the web app. So if we go back to Adafruit and we look at my program Untitled, um, and we hover over the on shake, do something when a gesture is done, like shaking the board. That came from the comment, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it also comes in, in Monaco editor. Yeah, so if we if we go to Monaco. I think there you also get the parameters. Uh, so let's see, so we'll do on gesture. So we you're get, just taking the, the, the notation that was, that was Already it originally came from, from Java Doc. Yeah, and, and TypeScript is basically used that as a standard. Okay. We, just, we just use that. Yeah. yeah. More questions? Okay, so uh, the last part then is on the way back down. Okay, so now we've, we've shown you sort of how we get the C++ annotated. <coughs> from that annotation, we get these TypeScript declaration files. Magic happens and we get the blocks. And now somebody presses download. Okay, oh, and we also have this binary file, the runtime. Um, oh, and I forgot to show you one important part. So let's do that. So here's when I compiled, uh, when I compiled Adafruit uh, earlier today, I got this nice, uh, I got this nice file called pointers.cpp, which essentially has all, all the namespaces and everything that's available to our compiler uh, for internal use as well as the public facing API. So it has a bunch of uh, uh, types here which are known to the compiler. Um, it has uh, different namespaces for language support, uh, for doing uh, what you might notice seem very close to assembly language instructions, uh, for doing some math, for doing things with collections, anything where you can imagine, hey, I want to go from uh, scripting language down to C++, uh, you'll find it in here. This is like the complete definition of all the things we need, the compiler needs. But then at the bottom, and this is all sort of boilerplate, uh, but then at the bottom, we're going to see a nice, a nice shims begin. So this is where we're going to have all these function pointers, uh, and these are the exports, essentially. So this is, so this includes a bunch of things from PXT, which need to be exported from the binary. That's sort of our runtime. And then down here, if I just do, if I search for on gesture, yeah. somewhere there is the C++ input on gesture. Right? And we're going to have a function for that. Right? So we're going to get, this is essentially our export table. Right? We know the order that things went in there. 
that's in, that's someplace else, and uh, and that's essentially that's essentially um, you know the result. Uh, I mean, we get a hex file, we get an actual binary in the end, um, but you can see here I, I have uh, you know I have some TypeScript I can code against that. I have my pointers. Uh, I have uh, I have on gesture, and then I, I, I actually have the value for that. Okay, so now going back down, this is going to be much shorter. Um, so the first thing to say is uh, we have this very low memory device. We are not going to run a JavaScript VM on it. So we cannot possibly take all of TypeScript because all of TypeScript includes all of JavaScript. So what we have done is we've defined something called static TypeScript, which essentially uh, is what the user is really programming against, but they don't know it because of type inference. Because everything in our API in our runtime is fully typed, you just say let x equal accelerometer value, it's going to be a number because we know what the accelerometer value is. Right? So the static TypeScript, the considerations are we need to compile the user code plus the runtime code we've written in static TypeScript to a low memory footprint. We want to link it against a precompiled C++ runtime, so we want that to be simpler than it might be with JavaScript. And then we want to know all time, we want to have all types known at compiled time. We want to minimize runtime checking. Right? to make it efficient. Because in the end, we do want students to take these embedded systems, embed them in projects, and maybe run them for weeks. Right? So we actually, we care a little bit about efficiency, and uh, uh, we're not like O3 on GCC or anything, but we're, we don't want to be running a garbage collector and doing lots of things you would with, with uh, JavaScript. So in TypeScript, there's the thing called the any type, which means any JavaScript value. It gets thrown out. You can't have the any type in static TypeScript. So no void star. Um, it's a subset of TypeScript, and there are some type substitutions like number in JavaScript is really a double, but for the purposes of some of the boards, it's really an N32. And we have different types of numbers and different ways of converting. Um, uh, we exclude anything dynamic, no eval function, no with statement, no type of expression. Uh, no prototype inheritance, no computer properties. I mean, there's a list of dynamic JavaScript features. They all get thrown out. But it turns out, for beginning programming and for embedded programming, you don't really need these things. In fact, you don't really want them. Right. So what do you, what's left after we throw all this stuff out? Uh, you have all the standard control flow of an imperative language. You have let's at least go variable declarations. You have nested functions, take that C, right? And you have lambdas, you can pass lambdas. We have closures. Um, you have classes with nominal typing, uh, with instance fields. You have interfaces. Uh, you have generic classes. You have namespaces. Pretty good starting language, right? So not bad for teaching. I mean, essentially, that's what people teach when they teach Java for a CS101, right? Is, is sort of this set of features. So that, that's, that's sort of what static TypeScript is. Um, so then what we have to do is we have to lower Blockly to static TypeScript. Blockly is just a data structure. It's just a tree that represents a program, and it doesn't really have a notion of type. So, of course, each of the blocks that corresponds to a TypeScript function from our runtime is typed. So we do type in principle over the block AST, and for the most part, um, while type errors are possible in Blockly, they're very rare. Students have to do funny things with using a variable as a number in one branch of if and as a string in another. And they, just, they just don't even think to do that, much less write an if than else. Right? So it turns out you know, we need to infer the types, uh, do a little type inference over the box uh, to look before we compile to static TypeScript. Static TypeScript and machine code, uh, the TypeScript, TypeScript gives us a language service, which we first run through. All those type checks have, should pass first. Um, and then we do extra checking on the static TypeScript subset. So there's, it's a very nice thing. The, the TypeScript language service gives us an adorned AST. It does all the work for us. Then Mihao's big pipeline comes in. We take that extra, extra elaborated AST. We lower it to an IR. Actually, there are many backends. There's one to JavaScript. There's one to a higher level assembly. Well, there's one to assembly, there's one to actually a, a little bytecode machine. We've experimented with our, our own bytecode machine. But in the end, we go to machine code all the way in the browser. And oh, and there's also quite a bit of tree shaking that goes on because you might have a bunch of TypeScript you pulled in, and we want, of course, the end code to be small. 
So we do a lot of tree shaking on the TypeScript AST. I should have put that on there. Uh, then Mihao has done a lot of work. So we have tagged integers. So we have 30, 30 bit integers? 31. 31 bit integers, sorry. 31 bit integers, uh, like MicroPython does. So obviously, for a lot of embedded code, um, most people are working with integers, not floats. And so, but we, you know, uh, but we need, we want to respect JavaScript semantics. So if you do something that, that uh, goes to a double or overflows uh, the 30, 31 bits, we, we, move, we, we box, we automatically coerce, we box, we move to doubles, give you JavaScript semantics. There's automatic conversion from our different notions of numbers. We have, we have cars and what do we have now? We, we have different sizes that, that we handle. Uh, we don't do garbage collection, so everything is reference counted, so you can create cycles and then memory doesn't get uh, reclaimed. But so far, most of the data structures, big data structures, are created by the runtime uh, by us, and we just are careful. Uh, we haven't found a need to really do garbage collection yet. Maybe that's just because of the, well, people haven't created the big sophisticated programs. But we'll get there. Uh, we have the table based layout of these nominally typed classes. So we've restricted no prototype inheritance, and we've gotten rid of subtyping based inheritance, a uh, subtype based inheritance from from TypeScript. And so we, we generate V tables. Uh, interfaces uh, support uh, multiple inheritance, and it's really nice. Classes don't have to declare the inner, they uh, they implement a particular interface. You can pass a class to a function, and then that function you can say I take this interface. And uh, since we do the lookup per method, uh, we can statically check and we can, uh, we can uh, do the, the runtime. Uh, so yeah, you get all the interfaces, and you get the interfaces as they are really in, in TypeScript, where um, the classes don't have to declare the inter We have uh, generics right now through code duplication, and Mia has done a lot of work to support various ES6 features. So get set accessors, lambdas, pour in, and also quite a bit of custom uh, debug support for both um, the JavaScript side on the simulator as well as the native compiler. ES6. Uh, huh? What is it, ES6? ES6 means JavaScript. It's uh, ECMAScript is the standardization of JavaScript. Pardon me. Yeah, <laughs> didn't spell that one out. Right, so um, if you have more questions about the compiler, yes. It sounds like you guys have made the uh, reverse mscript and n. Uh, mscript and n is a way to go from like uh, C++ to WebAssembly, or 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 uh, assembly or JavaScript rather. Sorry. Uh, so it sounds like you guys have done the opposite. Is there any like work or in the future, obviously, uh -huh. uh, of like pulling this out as its own separate project, so that people can theoretically write a somewhat limited TypeScript uh. code to generate C++ code? Oh, to generate C++. I see. So you're saying we're doing the reverse because MScript and takes. LLVM like code essentially, right. C++, and it gives me JavaScript Correct. or WebAssembly now, right. right? And we're sort of, we're sort of, we're, but we're, our, our, our IR, you're not going to get friendly looking C++ out. We used yeah. to do that. Right now, you know, but we, yeah. Google may not be friend, do friendly looking IR, or friendly looking C++ if it's passed right through a compiler. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. we could in principle for generate, for example, WebAssembly. Yeah. Yes. And then you can pass it to LLVM or whatever mm -hmm. to get whatever you Right. To the other side. We could do that. I think there are some assumptions about 32-bit architecture. Right, sure. Well, or less, actually, for ADR, but anyway. Yeah, so um, that's essentially the talk. I do have maybe a little more time, so maybe you want to do a few more demos to show you some of the other devices, if that's okay? Okay, cool. Um, let's do that. So um, one of the things we'll be, we've been doing uh, is something called maker.makecode.com. So a lot of these devices, like the microbit, or this funny brain pad thing with the monkey on the back and the human exchanging their brains, <laughs> if you haven't seen that, it's sort of worth a, worth a look. And they, they're what we call integrated devices, right? I mean, they have a lot of sensors on them. So out of the box, you can already do something with them. But what if you're given, you know, our Arduino Zero? Hmm, you can blink the system LED, that's always good. Blinky is a good start. But but once you've done that, you need to start to wire to the headers, right? And so there's an inherent you know complexity. I mean, we don't think of it as complex, but uh, some students and teachers might look at that and go, "Gosh, 
uh, I know what to do with the micro bit. What do I do with this thing? So we've worked um, actually for a couple years, and it's finally seen the light of day, of this maker.makecode.com. So this is for maker boards. So this is for any board that's fundamentally like an Arduino that has a bunch of headers, but you need to wire it to something to do something. And so we want to make this experience of starting with Arduino really simple. Uh, so let's choose, uh, I don't know, uh, the feather and make a new project. Okay, so the editor is going to look pretty familiar to you. Um, we're going to have a simulator on the left hand side. And this, this has, let's see, do I have that board here? Yes. Is it this one? No, uh, it's the, I don't know which one. No, I'm not sure. Uh, exactly. It is this one. Oh, it is this one, but with, does that have the, Oh, yeah, it's over there. We don't support that part of the chip. So that's this board. Oh. Okay, so what can we do with this board? Well, um, oh, this board actually has a pixel on it. So you could actually set the pixel color. Um, let's, let's say we want to do something on a button. So, well, we have this notion of a touch event on A0. So what happens if we click that? So we bring a handler out and we say, I want to do something when somebody presses a button. Oh! So we use the program and a set of basically predefined parts, not every part in the universe, but just a set of simple parts to say, oh, if you want to press a button and make something happen in the code, well, get yourself a breadboard, get yourself a button, here's the wiring. Okay, so now what do we want to do? Uh, we want to do some music. Okay, I want to play the power up sound. Okay, and it says, oh yeah, you're gonna need a speaker. Right, so this is sort of interesting, right? We're, we're programming language people, so we always think about the program first. And then the hardware, you just get some defaults. Eh, if you want to do your own special device and you're, no, I don't want that speaker, I want, you know, I need it. Anyway, you're going to be doing something different. But, but say you're a kid or a teacher who's got an Arduino style board and you want to get started. We're going to show you, uh, you can program, and then we'll show you what the wiring should look like, right? And it, it's, it's also simulated, so we can go here. And we can click that, and if I had my sound on. Oh my lord, sorry about that. So, so basically, you know, our simulator handles has an extension for breadboarding, and we have a notion for every one of these maker boards about the pinouts, right? And we have a pin map, and we have a set of components, hardware components, that are tied to particular APIs. So, for example, here, if we go to pins, and we say, Oh yeah, I want to uh, I want to do an analog, a digital write. Okay, what do you think is going to happen? I don't know. Uh, it's going to put in a resistor and an LED. That's what we chose. So so basically, if you want to do a digital write and blink, you're going to blink an LED because that's that's the part we associated with digital write. Mm -hmm. So if we're getting started, this is great. You can also do uh, you can also do servos. So if you go down here and say, you know, servo right pin, 180, it's starting to get crowded, but there's the servo, right? And then uh, let's do another input. Let's say on input, uh, touch A1. Okay, yet another button appears, and on that, I'm going to do the same servo at the same place. I'm going to write it to, I don't know, 90 degrees. Okay, then and B, right? So, so, so fundamentally, we, our bed, breadboard can expand to a certain limit, and that's probably the limit of what I can do now. But now let's say, okay, I want to, I want to make this crazy project. So what you do is you click on Open Assembly Instructions. And what we do is we generate an IKEA-style Nike style step-by-step -step instruction. And you might go, that's ridiculous. But teachers really like printouts. So like once you have that, once you have that thing, you can go to town uh, and you can go actually to town and buy the parts, right? So here it is. There's your construction. Um, and as we go, let me see, where's my that's not scrolling. Okay. This is embarrassing. Where's the next? Oh wait, it said that only one sheet of paper. That seems very wrong. Okay, well maybe we have maybe we have a problem there. Let me try it. Let me try it. 
Oh, no, there it is. So it generates a parts list, <laughs> right? It says, okay, first start with the board. That doesn't look good. And the breadboard. Okay, now you're going to take this wire from here to there. Okay. Yeah, so basically we, our intern who's now, um, he was an undergraduate when he did this. Uh, he's, now, he's now part of the Azure Sphere team. But, but anyway, this, is a, this has been an interesting experiment, and actually uh, Adafruit's gotten really excited about it, because if you see here, they make all sorts of little boards. They love variety. Variety is a spice of life, so they make this tiny little thing. What's that, the trinket? Mm -hmm. And this, this one, the Gemma, they like the round floor design. So they keep making these things, and, we, and it's really simple for us to add them, because we just need an SVG, and we need to know where the pins are, and we need to know essentially the functionality. So this has been a really fun one. Uh, this has been a really fun one to do because it expands to a long, a very long tail of, uh, of devices. Um, Any interest from Raspberry Pi? You know, we keep talking about that. Like every couple months, somebody says, "Yeah, what about Raspberry Pi?" So yeah, it's sort of. So we've experimented with Johnny Five, uh, which is like a way to talk to the Pi. And you know, they've just got such a healthy ecosystem already with the OS on the thing and the editors. And we just don't, I mean, people say, yeah, but there's like, who's actually going to do it? We're not going to do it because, I mean, we feel like we've got our sweet spot. And But yeah, every once in a while. Uh, but no, we don't have a... So everyone's interested and no one's actually done the Yeah, work. exactly. Everybody <laughs> says it's a good idea. Nobody wants to do the work. Right. Um, here, let me just go back to... Uh, to the, uh, to the I mean, the, it's just an IM chip. I mean, you can generate, I mean, you can generate code for IM. Right. It would all work. Right. Yeah. Here's another one. This is an interesting one by Seed. So this was a challenge for the simulator because instead of having a fixed device with a single SVG, you have you have these um, these devices that uh, chain together. And so we, we did quite a bit of work on the simulator here, but it follows the same general principle. Um, so for example, if I go here um, and say, okay, uh, I want to do some, something with an input. I get the button. Okay, there's the button appears. So you see there's sort of a carousel here. And on that carousel, when I, when I run the code, I can click and make that the main simulator. So I get to ch choose which of the many different parts there are, and then I can interact. So th this one was a bit of a challenge. Um, for example, here, we might say, oh, on button A, we want to I don't know, make a little, uh, I don't know what that is. Let's call it a snail. Okay, uh, and so here, you know, I can click on the button and say A, and you see the snail appears down here, and if I click on that, it appears up here. So, we, you know, the simulator has gone through, we have the breadboarding, we have this one, which is trying to uh, work with a set of chainable components. Um, so, interest, each one of these things, and then this thing's a robot that we actually don't write the full app for. It's not a web app. They have a they have a native app, and they embed us as a web view. So we've also experimented with different ways of delivering make code into different uh, into different uh, sort of scenarios. Um, so I think with that, since we're at an hour and twenty, uh, probably is a, a good time uh, a good time to stop. But I'd like to thank you again, um, you know, for your attention and your time, and just you know leave you with that picture about uh, about all the work we did to bring these the world of the web app and the microcontroller together. So thanks. <laughs>